everybody. It's me, Sammy here. Um, thank you guys so much for coming to Savvy Portfolio Building, which is going to be a webinar all about how you can craft projects to get visible, find mentors, and grow your skills. Now, um, I'm Sammy Gardner. I'm a career specialist from Career Foundry, and then we're going to have, um, hi, Allison, and then we have Yakub, who's going to be behind the scenes. He's going to be taking your questions and putting them in a place where I can see them. So thank you guys for coming. It looks like we got a bunch of people. It looks like we got Charlie from the Netherlands. Um, let's see, where is everybody from? Because I know that we got the Netherlands. We got, oh, we got Florida. We got Canada, San Jose. Awesome. Okay, sweet. We got a ton of Germans and Californians. I think that's who we're split between. So that's super cool. Oh, we got a Michigander. Hey, Michigander. So awesome. Thanks so much for you guys coming. Um, I'm really excited to, ooh, we got one person is from Arizona. I'm from, I'm doing this from Arizona too. So sweet. Awesome. It seems like you guys are from all over, but what I'm going to talk about in this webinar is going to be applicable across the board. And in fact, for some of you guys, um, implementing some of these tactics, even early in your your UX or your data analysis or your web development training can be super helpful, really give you a good launch. Um, ooh, we have a Peruvian in California. I love Peruvian food. I know that has nothing to do with anything, Stephen, but welcome. Um, <laughs> before I get distracted by the, the chat section, we should continue on, but Remember, as we go, as I go through this, if you do have questions, type them in the chat. Yakub will take them um, and uh, present them, and I'll answer all the questions after I'm done. So, thank you, guys. Now, let's get to it. So, like I said, I'm Sammy Gardner. So, I'm a career specialist at Career Foundry. Um, I, I used to be a librarian. I've done LinkedIn consulting. Um, I'm a digital nomad on hiatus, so I'm more of a digital homebody now. Um, I was working working remotely before it was cool. Um, and I've been doing that with Career Foundry for the last, I think, four years now, nearly four years, so a long time. Um, and in that time, I've seen a lot of portfolios. Um, as you guys probably already know, portfolios are extremely important to breaking into tech. So what I've noticed is that a lot of students work really hard, but sometimes their efforts could be done in a better way. The old work smarter, not harder. So I'm going to get into more about um, in this webinar, we're going to talk about what recruiters are looking for in your portfolio, how portfolio projects can build your network and brand, finding and creating quality projects, and tactics to promote your portfolio to attract attention in your industry. Now, this goes back to the working smarter, not harder, because if you don't have some intentionality and some forethought into the projects that you're creating, it can lead to you, yes, maybe making a number of projects, but they might not really fit with what um, your target employers are looking for. And you could create a, a portfolio that could do a lot more for you with less time and effort. Um, one thing that I tell people is that this is a job hunt, not a <laughs> job cakewalk. So you really got to work at it. However, it can be stressful. It can be tiring. So you want to think about actions in your job hunt that can kind of be the old uh, two birds, one stone. Um, I know that that's an English idiom. So sorry, guys. Um, we have a lot of people in other countries. But it's essentially how you can have, you know, two outcomes with one effort. So let's go into it. Now, why portfolios? Portfolios allow you to show and not just tell your work. Now, this is very important for a lot of students because they, they don't have as much out there yet, do they? You know, you're new, you might not have any work experience, and your portfolio is a way for you to showcase 
what exactly you've learned and the value and the fact that you can actually implement what you've learned. Now, right now we are, I mean, if you think about just millennials alone, and we're not including like Gen Xers or the younger ones and everything, we're pretty much the most educated generation. Having degrees and certificates is something that just a lot of us simply have. You know, however, the way that you send out even among all these other qualified candidates is the fact that you can show that you can actually implement what you've learned. That is the thing that actually, at least in tech, decides a lot for you. I've noticed with tech employers and people are hiring for either tech teams or for a tech position, oftentimes there's a split. It seems like half will look at your resume first and half will look at your portfolio. And what do you want your portfolio to say? What's it supposed to do for you? Your portfolio is supposed to give that employer such a good understanding of what you can do that they can visualize you doing that for their company. It's why having projects that are curated for your career goals is so important because then you have a portfolio that's going to be easier for somebody to imagine you doing that kind of work for them. So an example is if you have a e-com, um, let's say your goal is like e-com or something like that. Um, if you have a bunch of projects that are in that realm, it's going to be easier for a company to be like, oh, okay, to want to evaluate you, see if you'd be successful, and it's going to make you stand out. If it already looks like you've done research in this field to do this project, even if you haven't worked in it, that is something that an employer likes to see. So portfolios allow you to show your work and not just tell it. This is great for folks who maybe they're, you know, they don't want to like seem too cocky or too braggy and everything like that. Your portfolio is going to speak for you. So what should your portfolio actually have? Now, people might disagree. Some people want your portfolio to have quite a bit, but if we're thinking about just the bare minimum of what your portfolio should include. One, it should have information about you, your technical process, whether it's how you um, implement um, user experience design, how you analyze data, how you um, code, you know, a little bit about that, and then your work experience. So oftentimes people find that a short bio section will usually do the trick. Um, you can make it longer or shorter depending on your brand and what you're going with it. But mostly you want to give them just a little bit of information about you as a person and you as a professional. Then your portfolio should have ways to contact and connect with you. Your portfolio is your hub on the web. It's one of those things where if someone's going to be Googling your name or looking for designers in your area, you want your portfolio to come up. Or at the very least, even if maybe like an old Behance shows up, your portfolio, your main hub on the internet will always be updated. And that's going to be the place where people will see the freshest, you know, signs of your work, even if maybe you're not still on GitHub or what have you. So you want to make sure that this portfolio is your hub on the web, that this is the place where it's where you make it easy for potential employers to find you. You know, you make it um, easy for friends to refer you. Um, and you want to make sure that this is where you collect all those different social media. You know, if you have a professional LinkedIn and a professional Twitter, um, of course, you want to make sure that your Twitter is carefully curated. Um, don't put any like non-professional, like your personal Instagram or something. But, you know, where you are professional on the web, make sure that those are, are listed. Then you want to have demonstrations of your work. So for most people um, in our programs, this is going to take the form of powerful case studies, supplemental um, artifacts showing the works that you've done. Um, you don't need to have a bunch of portfolio pieces. Um, three to five of your best projects could be enough. 
but they need to highlight the core skills that you are marketing for yourself. So if you're billing yourself as a UX researcher, but you don't have a UX research project, it's going to be hard for you to stand out for those jobs that you're going for. Um, a real example that I have is when I was helping recruit web developers and the client company specifically wanted to see some sort of JavaScript project in their portfolio. And I did find some really good candidates who ended up not you know, continuing on the hiring process because they didn't have anything that, you know, was source code for JavaScript. None of their projects really had anything that, you know, the, um, the hiring team could evaluate. So you want to make sure that your portfolio is proving um, your skill set, that it is very much answering the question that most employers are going to have when they come to your website, which is, what can this person do for me? Now, the last thing that I think um, is good to showcase on a portfolio, that's social proof, so that's testimonials, references. You want to show that you're proud of the work that you've done and that former clients and colleagues are happy to voice their appreciation of your skills. Um, so another thing to think about is if you're like, oh, man, but I'm really new. I don't I don't have testimony. I don't have references. You can also have maybe some social proof in the form of blog entries that you've done. Maybe you've spoken at a conference. Uh, maybe, you know, you did a, a student panel, which sometimes Career Foundry does. Those can all be social proof of your interest in this industry. This is all ways for you to show that you're not um, just some some casual who's shown up on the tech scene, that you're actually here to to work and that you are you have something to say. You're engaging with the community. So let's talk about portfolio portfolio mistakes. Um oh D it, yeah I think there is going to be a recording. Um, sorry, I just saw that I got uh, um, distracted. But let's talk about bum, ba, da, things you could be doing wrong. So common portfolio mistakes. Now, for those of you guys who already have a portfolio, how about you open it up? Look through it and see if you, you're doing any of these things. So the first portfolio mistake is that you're not thinking about your user. You need to consider what a potential client or employer will be looking for and how they'll be viewing your portfolio. Now, this is going to be completely different from a friend or a colleague. Now, how you assess what your target companies are looking for is literally collect some job listings from them see what they're hiring for you know see what they're asking for if you don't have a specific company in mind you can just do um, a random sor assortment of um, job listings for the job hell that you want to go for see the patterns what are people looking for um, what is a competency that you know they're all asking for you can also look up on like linkedin if you do have a target company who's working at this company now and in, in the jobs that you want what do they do to get there you want to make sure that your portfolio is going to be resonating or at least hitting the mark with these people now an example of that this is kind of like a very t um like a very specific example um but I had a student who really wanted to work for a faith-based organization. Um, so when she was at Career Foundry, there's an option um, for one of our projects to do like a little like tattoo app. However, with the kind of conservative um, companies that she wanted to work for, a tattoo app would probably go over as well as a tattooed person, you know? So she decided and got permission to do something a little bit different. And she did like a project that was more about like Bible education for children. It was something that really fit with her demographic because she wanted to work in the educational side of a faith-based organization. Um, so with that tailored project, she actually had that one project which became she did the example of like the website 
she did a case study on it and she also showed her research so she took essentially one project and made it three and it was so tailored it was very well done and it was something where her application materials her portfolio was so on point for the companies that she was targeting that she only sent out eight applications before she got hired um i believe she was only out of the course like for a month you know before that happened because she had thought about her users so carefully that even though she's probably less experienced she's actually in um colorado springs so colorado has quite a tech community um, around boulder and denver and everything like that so there was hometown competition there is tech talent there but she was able to beat them out because she had a project that fit what her company her companies that she was the target ones that she was going for it just fit them so well so that's the power of thinking about your user now for those of you guys who might be in our data or web development courses you might not always be thinking about the user but my ux and ui students y'all should be obsessed with the user think about with your portfolio actually doing the ux framework the design process to you know kind of conceptualize your portfolio it's going to make it stronger if you do that now let's see the next thing is while including too many examples of your work can be a portfolio mistake um, especially if it's kind of confusing how you have it set up most designers at the beginning of their careers often make the opposite mistake they're showing too little you want to make as you want to make projects that are reflecting each of those big skills that you're marketing. So if you want to do more of a general UX with an emphasis, maybe more on the research, then you need to like have a case study. You know, you might want to have um, a project that's either mobile or desktop if you, you know, your case study is on the other one. Um, and you'll want something that has to do at least with research. You know, you want to make sure that, especially when you're new, that you're showing your versatility, you're showing your aesthetic, you're showing um, your skills off as much as you can. Um, let's see, the next one is there's zero personality to your portfolio. Now, this can happen in a number of ways. Maybe you don't have an about me statement. Maybe you're you know, nervous about having a, um, a very distinct visual brand. Sometimes it's because you might accidentally be using the same template and verbiage that many others do in your industry. An example of this is UX designers using the Squarespace template that's called York and then having some little tagline on the website that says, I don't know, Susie Q, UX designer, you know, designs elegant interfaces and pixel perfect interactions or something like that. On their own, a York template and that kind of statement is not bad. However, for juniors, like, I swear that like, it seems like, 80 to 90 percent of junior portfolios have that are like that so what can you do to make yourself stand out if you're a designer try to showcase your own aesthetic you want to have a visual brand that's consistent from your resume to your linkedin to your portfolio that lets people know about you that shows what you offer as a professional um and that about me section some people just do a little bio statement. You could go a little bit more wild with that. Maybe you have a timeline. Maybe you're talking a lot more about your career interests or you know, your journey into UX, whatever. You can make your portfolio be a reflection of not just your work, but of you. Um, and the last one is your portfolio wasn't designed with a specific objective in mind. If you don't think about what you want your website to achieve, how will you know if you've achieved it? So before you sit down, before you start, sit down and have a good long think about what your main goals are. If you are in the job prep course, you know that we spend a lot of time in the first couple of modules hammering in 
what your why is, what your motivation is. Why are you actually doing this? Now, that is key because if you don't have that concrete goal, you're not going to create a project that will really um, or really stick the landing for you. Um, so let's see. It looks like we have a bunch of questions that I will answer. So keep putting your portfolio questions in the, the comments. I'm going to make sure that we have plenty of time to answer them. Um, awesome. Now, I Winnie has a question here about it seems like portfolios are becoming more common. Yes. For nearly... For nearly every industry that is creative or technical, portfolios are becoming required. It's because there's so many um, there's so many people that want to be in these fields. These roles are getting tougher, um, and companies want to be able to evaluate you, you know, um, and just learn a little bit more about you. And it helps you stand out. And I feel like for a lot of um, a lot of people, because we're not networking the same way, like let's say our grandparents did, where they went down to Main Street and they, you know, looked people in the eye and shook their hands and blah, blah, blah. Um, there's different things that we need to do to brand ourselves, and having a portfolio is important for that. It seems like a pain in the butt, and a lot of people resent that they have to do it. But honestly, it's one of the best things that you can do for your career because one, it's your calling card, two, it also allows you to kind of actually reflect on what you've done so it sinks in a little bit more. But let's talk about what recruiters look in the portfolios. Now, it's going to be mostly the pictures because I don't understand nothing else. That is the unfortunate thing about this situation. You're going to you're going to be evaluated by someone who does not have a tech or design background. They're going to have a list of keywords. They're going to have some processes that they need to, you know, see if you know, and maybe some picture examples. Um, I've seen guides for recruiters on hiring um, designers, and they'll literally be like, is this portfolio pretty? Is this visually pleasing? You know, um, so you want to make sure, and they're spending you know, they might only be able to have a couple of minutes because they could be reviewing many applicants. So your portfolio needs to be easy to navigate. You need clearly labeled projects. So as I said before, if they're specifically looking to hire you as a UX researcher, for instance, make sure they can find your research projects easily. As I said before, visually pleasing. Now, you don't need to have a design background. To notice formatting errors, wonky colors, or unintuitive information architecture. So yes, these people might not always be able to articulate to you what, in you know, a design savvy kind of kind of way, what's wrong with your portfolio. But if they get lost somewhere, if there is a design element that maybe doesn't work, like there's a carousel of images or something that's stuck that they can't navigate, they're going to notice that. They know that that is poor UX. They know that's poor web development. Um, so even though they don't have a tech background, they, they're still going to be savvy enough to know if something's wrong. They might not be able to articulate it. And if they don't have that tech background, they might not understand if you're trying to be overly clever with how you are creating your portfolio as well. So the thing is about this is that you will have two users. This is not the end of your users. You're actually <laughs> going to end up with another user after you make it through the first round. You're going to end up talk. You're going to have your portfolio evaluated by someone who knows design and tech most likely better than you. They will be checking out the design of your portfolio as much as your individual product projects. They will notice the nuance and the detail of the experience architecture, choice of what is above and below the fold, UI elements. Um, they're going to want to see if you know the Gestalt principles. So they're going to be looking at the balance of your website. 
how the symmetry of it when it comes to the graceful degradation do you have a website that you know is maybe like one of those like horrible like old flash websites that don't really work anymore like they're going to be seeing like hmm, is this maybe like an obsolete technology or it's not maybe mobile responsive they're going to look at the accessibility um this has been something that i've had an issue with lately um because i'm getting new glasses so for me i've been going to a lot of these students portfolio websites where they have a white background with this like light medium gray text so i'm like i'm like squinting like this being like i think they do ui i can't read now you want to make sure that your website your portfolio the actual container for your projects is as well designed as your projects are because they're going to be evaluating that as well um so i know it sounds really tricky to have these two audiences um oh what is above or below the fold if you go to a website um Kamanji, if you go to a website, you'll notice how when you first come to the page, there's that top half that usually says, welcome to the page and everything. And then you scroll down and then you might see the rest. They say whatever you show when a website first loads, that is above the fold. And then whatever you have to scroll to see, that's below the fold. It comes from um, newspaper terminology. So that is part of the visual hierarchy. If the above the fold has something kind of random and useless, but below the fold is where it says your name, that you're a designer, you know, when someone comes to your portfolio, that's going to be something a lead designer is going to be like, hmm, you know, this person doesn't know what's supposed to be on top, um, essentially. What should be on top? Um, so hopefully that... Um, Hopefully that explains it. But those those are the sort of things that people are going to be thinking. They're also going to be thinking this when they look at your resume as well. There's going to this thing about the two users because we're talking about the recruiters and the hiring people that look at your portfolio first. There's people who look at your resume first, and they're also considering that a design document. So keep that in mind. Um, as you go forward, the container of your website needs to be just as good. So we're going to get to where this webinar gets savvy, where we're going to talk about how you can actually strengthen your skills, network with professionals, employers, and grow your personal brand at the same time. You can do this with portfolio building, which I love because I'd rather do one thing and get more effort for it. Let's see, this is your brand. Keep that in mind for every resume you write, every LinkedIn profile you update, every portfolio website you make, this is your brand. If you are in design, your portfolio doesn't only show your work, it shows how well you can craft a brand. Well, senior designers and recruiters will notice a well-developed personal brand. Now, even if you're not in UI or UX design, it's still valuable to have an understanding of this branding, especially if you're a developer or a data analyst who wants to move up in the industry, who wants to be known, who wants to be remembered. You want to have that brand. Now, for those of you guys who get intimidated by the idea of a personal brand, think about it as a reputation. That's all it is, essentially. Yes, now we have a color scheme to go with it, but it's not far removed from what your grandparents were doing when they were establishing their careers in the before, before times um, without, you know, the Internet. Now we do. We have websites. We're in tech. We have the Internet. We have to make sure that our brand is a little bit, you know, jazzier, but it's still the same thing. Be intentional with what you want your reputation to be so you can make sure you can convey that through the visuals of your brand and the artifacts that you put in your portfolio. So when I'm thinking about getting strategic with projects, I would challenge you to, and you can do this right now, in fact, um, if you have a notebook and a pen, remember pens? 
write down exactly what you want with your career change or with your career development. Start with what you want this year, that small step that you might have, whether it's to get into training, whether that is to land an internship, then go and write, what do I want for the next two to five years? You know, maybe it's that first job in the industry. Maybe that is speaking at conferences. You need to know what you want. Because if you know it early enough, you can actually make sure that you're saving a lot of time for yourself and a lot of energy. So some further questions you can ask are, when you're thinking about portfolio building, because you can build a portfolio that strengthens quite a bit about um, your skill set and your brand, and you can do a lot to make sure that this this project is improving things for you in more ways than one. So you can ask yourself, what are your technical weaknesses? What industry do you want to work in? What software should you practice? What skills do your ideal employers want? We ask the first question because if you do have a technical weakness, maybe you need to improve your skill at Figma, you can think about a project that can incorporate that technology. Maybe one of your weaknesses is doing user research. You can think about how can I practice that. When you think about what industry you want to work in, that means that you can think about, okay, what kind of projects are they interested in? If I want to work in, you know, um, maybe, you know, for just a e-commerce or retail or something, maybe I should build a store. Um, what software should you practice? That's something where like, you no, know, and this is for some of the students who they might, um, they might want to, you know, not just practice their software, but maybe they're they're nervous about something. Like if you're not quite sure what software you're pra you should practice, ask your course mentor. They probably have a bunch of feedback on what you can do. That means with your project, you can actually boost some of these skills. You can turn that weakness into a strength. And of course, you want to understand the skills that your ideal company wants. You know, you want to have an idea, your finger on the pulse of the market to know what's actually valuable. So those are some questions to ask yourself. So what is the secret sauce um, to making a ideal portfolio project that's going to hit a lot of your KPIs? One, it's a project that connects you with a desired field or industry. It strengthens needed skills, and it relates to the jobs that you will be applying for. Those, if you have a project that can hit all three of those buttons, that is the project to pursue. Whenever you're thinking about how, what projects I should do, and keep in mind, if you do the job prep course, the final module in that says, hey, you're almost done with this job prep course. Where are you going to take your education and your portfolio from here? And you need to think about this because if you can keep on practicing your skill set, keep on making projects, that can be a great icebreaker to, you know, actually start talking to us, some other designers. So you want to really think about this. Is it going to connect you with anybody? Is it going to strengthen your skills? Is it, you know, relevant to your goals? That's what you want to think about with every project. Ask yourself those three questions every time you have a project idea. If it's a project that only maybe does one of these, you can probably find a project that is going to actually work a little bit harder for you. So what are some portfolio boosters? Now, some of my favorites include online community challenges. Why? Because these give you a chance not just to, um, to work on your skills, it also connects you with the community. So, and you want to think outside the box for these projects. You know, you want to, you know, check out things like, even if you're not, you know, maybe, super interested um, at being just a UX writer, but you know that you want to work on that skill set, you know it's going to be important because you want to maybe do UX in with a marketing team, then the Daily UX Challenge 
could be a good idea. Having something like Code Wars, you know, where you actually are, you know, engaging with other developers. And when you actually are maybe promoting these projects that you've done on LinkedIn, you can use the hashtag for these communities, and that's actually going to broadcast your post. So send it farther outside your network to the other people who are doing this challenge. So it actually gives you some good visibility. Now, another thing to do is some freelancing. So freelancing, it can bring in income, and it also proves your skill in client management management. I like freelancing or any sort of like group project for our students because since you've been working with a tutor and a mentor, which is a great environment, but you're working with two people who are very focused on you learning in your learning environment, which is fabulous. But in the real world, you know, someone might say you need to change this project, the information, you know, architecture, you know, isn't isn't working on this section and that might just be it you know here you go fix it you know they might not spend as much time making sure that you know in a way that's really you know delicate to your self-esteem what you need to correct you know so i think for toughening up your skin learning what people actually want Freelancing is an awesome way to do this. You can get small projects from your personal network. You can try Upwork and Fiverr. You can actually pitch yourself to local companies. Another thing that you can do is um, actually go do hackathons. Um, so hackathons are really awesome. I'm actually going to drop in. Ooh, that is not clear cut. Um. I'm gonna fit, I'm gonna delete that, but I'm gonna let yeah I'm gonna send Yakub all these hackathon links um, that I have. Um, ooh, um, but yeah, so I have a bunch of those. But hackathons are really cool because you work with people. Um, they're usually local, so you can get to actually meet people in your area, and you'll have a project at the end of it, and you'll have a number of people outside your tutor or mentor that can vouch for your skills. Another great thing to do is volunteering for charities, and that can lead to um, referrals and real-world projects. So COVID Watch, UX Rescue, um, other organizations. I like these because I've noticed that with some recruiters, um, or at least there's companies that are saying this, who knows how many people are, but they um, a common question now is, oh, you know, during COVID, you know, how were you spending that time you know trying to see like did you do any open source projects or anything like that if you have a gap because of covid you can actually say well during that time i was working on an app that helped contact tracing or something like that and that's going to be something that's going to be impressive to the employer because it's going to show that you're even if you are you know unemployed you're still very active in the community and giving back so volunteering is a fabulous way um, to, to get that experience. Um, at the end of the day, um, let's see. Ooh, no, I have another one. And group projects, because if you can't get another organization to, to work with, if you can't find them, you can make your own. Find some classmates, find some buddies. Um, why? Because this is going to show that you can collaborate, it's networking, and recruiters are more impressed by collaborative projects because it shows that you know how to act in the, sometimes the conflict that comes with design and development. Um, let's see. Now, how to get some group experience. So you can make this group so you can pick someone to be a designer, a researcher, developer. I do recommend recommend that you have one person who acts as the project manager and gets everybody together. Now, Ashley says, how would I do all this extra stuff? You don't have to do all of this. In fact, that's part of why you need to look at your actual goals and think about what is an activity that is going to be portfolio building, networking, and it's going to be efficiently hitting my goals. So for you, Ashley, it could be something where 
maybe you have um, a spe specific goal or something like that and you do one group project that might be an hour a week or something um, that you can that you can do. That's part of this is knowing what you want and thinking of the strategic steps to get it. So you're not running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Um, so yeah. So in the end, when it comes to your portfolio, think outside the box, reach into your network to find opportunities to maybe code a website for a friend's band, design an app for a local business, conduct a user survey for a professional organization, or think about, for those of you guys who are working right now, how can you add UX or web development or analysis to your current job? One of our students actually recently got hired, um, Norman. He was working as a waiter in a steakhouse. And he actually convinced his bosses to let him redesign their website and design a Alexa voice app for them. That was just, that became part of his duties at work. So you might find that you can incorporate, if you can't do a portfolio project that's extracurricular or something like that, you might be able to incorporate it into your day job. That's part of our, um, just ideating on what you want, what resources you have, whether that's time, whether that's connections, and see how you can make some magic to make this portfolio happen. And the beauty of tech is that it's not like being an undersea welder or a long distance trucker or a heart surgeon. You can create your own experience, you know? So get creative with your projects, tailor them to showcase the skills you wanna use, and focus on the industries that you wanna work with. These real world projects do count with recruiters, but more importantly, they add to your confidence. A lot of UX designers suffer from imposter syndrome. My web devs are usually pretty confident, but definitely with my UI UX designers, just like a raging ball of nerves. So if you are actually taking action to practice your skills, then you are going to get that confidence that you want and you need when it comes to presenting yourself in an interview. So how do you um, <laughs> so how do you promote your portfolio? And a lot of people are like, oh my God, this is so intense. Part of this is figuring out what you want and then choosing one portfolio building activity that also leads to some networking opportunities. So literally guys, you don't need to like do all of these. You don't need to do all of these guys. You can choose one thing that you want to do and that can maximize your efforts around here. So don't freak out guys. Now I'm going to answer everybody's questions but I'm just going to get to this one last slide on how to promote your portfolio. So you're going to be the main driver of traffic to your portfolio. So you want it linked on your LinkedIn, your Dribble, your GitHub, your Slack. Um, another way to do that is for people who like to blog. Um, there's definitely folks who have shared about their UX journey. So they might have a medium blog. So they've linked to their portfolio there. Um, maybe they did a challenge. So they might share in a challenge community and they might use hashtags. Um, you could also be featured by a school. Um, Career Foundry is always looking to highlight students. Um, I actually did put an offer, you know, in the Slack community, like, hey, if you want me to promote your portfolio on my LinkedIn, let me know. Um, and of course, networking events and hackathons. So there's a lot of ways that you can get your portfolio out there. But as you can see, there's not a one size fit all. You know, whatever your needs are, whatever your goals are you can create a tailored plan that honors the time that you have and your energy and also your goals so you can meet them. So with that being said, it's question time, everybody. We got 15 minutes on here. I want to answer all your questions. Um, hopefully I didn't scare you because for some of this, I was looking at my notes. So when I pop back in, it seemed like I had made people nervous in the meantime. So I'm interested to see what your questions are and how I can, you know, like reassure people. So 
what if you do not have a fixed area as mentioned in the example? So if that means like you haven't figured out your exact goal yet, it's okay if you haven't been like, I am going to be a UX designer in a software as a service company that's based in Singapore and has a five-year plan to be blah, blah. Like it doesn't need to be that specific. It could also be like, I have a background, maybe like you're a career changer and you used to be a nurse. That means that your focus could be doing healthcare UX design. So you at least know your industry. And that way, you know what the heck people want to see when they come to your portfolio. A lot of times, with especially with my UX designers, and I'm always surprised by this, that the element of UX training, they forget that they can apply that to their own job search. Um, and for a lot of you guys who are in dev and stuff like that, you'll be able to you know, make your own metaphors and everything. But you want to make sure that you have at least some idea of what you want because students who want to be really general the ones who are like i'll work anywhere those students have ironically enough a tougher time because they don't stand out they want to be all things to all people and that doesn't i mean that doesn't always make you like actually stand out in a crowd and make people notice you more because most time those people are also sending very generic resumes out you know so have a bit of a vision and a mission, and that's going to make all the difference. Do you have any suggestions for creating a product manager portfolio, especially if it's B2B and you can't show the projects as such? Okay, if you're under an NDA, this is pretty common. Um, one thing that you can do is either reach out to the company and see if there's something that you can highlight. You can also, for the PM stuff, if you, that could be a situation where maybe you work with a charity to do like a one-off consulting, so you can write a case study on that, or you make some notes. Like you don't have to have a full UX style case study for your project management. You can have a short little write-up that has some pictures, that has some outcomes, um, and that can be enough. What are some cool platforms for hosting, posting portfolios? Um, a lot of people will host their own portfolio, um, like using a WordPress or Squarespace or something. One of my favorite new tools right now that's actually becoming more and more popular is Notion. Um, SO, I do enjoy that. I think that's a really good free option. Um, some people use Wix or Weebly. Um, so I would go with whatever your strengths are. So if you're already comfortable with um, having a WordPress website, do that. Um, let's see. I struggle with finding the balance of being too creative in terms of personality versus not being take, taken serious or professional. I have a question. Is this something that somebody told you directly and said, hey, you're acting like a clown in here? Or is this something that you're thinking? Because I say this because there's, um, for folks who are maybe coming from like finance or something like that, and they're from a more traditional um, career path, they might not realize that it takes all kinds in tech. There's plenty of folks who are really um, who are laid back and stuff like that and still taken seriously. So whenever you have a question like that, think about, have I gotten direct evidence from another human that actually confirms this or is this all in my head um let's see career foundry how about video of us include introducing ourselves yeah anything that you can do to make your portfolio more engaging more resonating that actually kind of makes you from a portfolio to a person to whoever's looking at it yes i would definitely do that and it's something to keep in mind for some of you guys who are going for these um, maybe small to medium sized startups. There's a lot of startups where everybody is involved in the social media. I mean, look at I'm doing a webinar here. They make me do Instagram. You know, nobody hired me and said in three years, you're going to have to slap on your eyebrows and tell people about resumes on Instagram. Nobody said told me that. But it happens. So the sooner you can be more comfortable with that. Not that every company will make you but i think it's it's a it's a good skill to practice to get over that nervousness on video 
Okay, next question is, what if I want to put my current project um, in my portfolio, but I'm afraid that the project has confidentiality rules? I would find out exactly what those rules are. Because you can worry about it in your head all day, but until you actually look at the contract, you won't know. Um, sometimes how people go around that is that they just anonymize. So you can say, oh, for a company, and just say, you know, we're not naming it or something like that, and just kind of make some of the slides a little bit different, you know. So next question, when establishing a personal brand, does it mean that all your student projects should be similar in style, color, and wording? No, it should not all be the same. Yes, it'd be nice if you have a clear aesthetic that runs through it. Like I had um, one student who used to be an illustrator, so his projects were all different styles and colors and varieties, but his um, signature sort of figure drawing style was in all of them. But no, that's not a requirement. In fact, you want to show some variety. I would say that how you set them up, you should think about, okay, maybe all of my projects, The when I show the hex code, I set it up as like a divider or something like that. You can have common motifs in them. Um, and that does show that you have some forethought about how you set up your projects, but it's not required. How will I find out what industry I want to work with when I have no experience in any of them? Um, the thing about the tech industry is that like everything's the tech industry now. There's microchips and shoes. Um, there's science, you know, there's agriculture science. So if you just are interested, think about what you're already interested in. Are there any problems that we're facing as a society that you're interested in? Is there maybe like your past career? You know, you can, I tell a lot of career changers, if you're worried about how you might be um, about competing in the open market, go for an industry that you're already familiar with. I have one student who used to be in finance. Now he is targeting fintech companies and he's getting a response because he already has a subject matter expertise, even if he's not um, an experienced developer yet. So I would think about what you've done in your past, what you're actually interested in, and expand on from there. When you have a group project, do you put the whole project on your portfolio or the only part you worked on? The whole project. To be honest, most of you guys will not be the only designer. Like you guys will be taking like on the job probably parts of any one project. So it's actually more realistic to have a project where you might not go into depth about other people's parts, but you know, it still shows that you know how to collaborate within a team. Um, how far into the project do you need to go to put it in your portfolio? You can have it be half. It can be like in progress, just label it as that. Just put a label at the bottom or the top in progress and that you're adding to it. In fact, that's something that I've seen some designers do, um, newbie designers do on LinkedIn, where instead of just posting one link, they almost like uncover like each section, they post about each section of their project as they finish it. So it's kind of an interesting way to bring people on your journey. Um, what is the challenge community? What are these challenges? These are just like, okay, you know how like um, there's like a national novel writing month and there's different challenges for, for different activities or like personal development. There's like the, you know, the 22 day push up challenge or something. Tech has those. So there's one for the UX writing challenge. It's like for 15 days, you get a different writing prompt. Um, the UI challenge will send you a design element prompt every day. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's, it's an easy way to get inspiration. Does your portfolio have to be minimalistic? Or can it be bright and full of colors? That depends on your brand. I would say, like, if your style is minimalistic, then, it, then have it be minimalistic. But if it's bright and full of colors, do that. One of the, I forget if she works at Amazon or Google, but one of the coolest prod portfolios I've seen is this woman who, when you navigate her website, it's almost like an old NES game. It's like all pixelated and old, like 
90s Nintendo. And when you're scrolling through, um, there's a little figure that moves through it, you know, and it's like has kind of like UXy stuff. Like it almost looks like a like Candyland meets like an old Game Boy because you got to go through like a UX mountain and then it takes you like anyway, it's cool. So you can have a portfolio that's wild and fun just as much as you are. Like, don't feel like you have to like be stodgy to blend in. I mean, tech is an industry where like they will literally be like, we have some bean bags in the foosball table. You know, like it's not, <laughs> it's not a fancy crowd, you know? Um, so I'm at the beginning of the UX immersion and every part is very interesting. What do you, what is your advice to, to clarify which part of UX I would enjoy the most? Taking action. You know what you like and what you don't like after you try to do it. The more you can experience, that's part of why portfolio building is good because you learn what parts of this process you do and do not like. You don't want, like one of my students who specialized in research because that was part of her background. And then she actually had to do use her research for a company and realized she actually didn't like it. And then she switched to the visuals. If she had maybe done more research style projects, she might have realized that. Um, uh, should I adjust my portfolio making it related to the job I apply? No. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. That's why we have a variety of different projects that are kind of hitting some of the marks for these different jobs you're applying for. Your resume should be tailored to the, your resume and your cover letter should be tailored, but your portfolio can be sort of universal. Um, sometimes we work so much on our portfolio. What do we know when we have done enough and can start applying for jobs? I would start applying for jobs when you have a resume that's been confirmed by your career specialist and you have at least one portfolio projects, but that's been confirmed by your course mentor. Like there's no reason to, to wait on these things. You can get applying. It takes a while for companies to get back to you anyway. So you could have another portfolio piece up. Um, and most of the time you're going to need to practice setting out these applications, writing these letters anyway. So you're never going to be like done, you know, um, cause you're usually waiting for a perfection and perfection doesn't exist, you know? So I would just, once you have the foundation, get yourself out there. I have a, and that last question, I have a background in architecture and I'm very, and I'm working as an architect. Um, I'm very comfortable with visual tools. How do I showcase this and such as the background adds value? Um, I would sh okay, you're probably using AutoCAD, which is like one of the most difficult software in the world. You would just use, um, like you probably wanna have a full case study, but you would show your old projects um, that you've done, like in architecture. So you can have like blueprints, maybe drawings and stuff like that. Showcase that you already know what you're doing. We've had many architects go through a program. So let's see, is there any, um, and Charlie, the examples of the challenge communities to join are actually on this slide. Let's see, there we go. You can Google those, Charlie. Um, I think I got everything. Um, and Himanshi, the objectives are literally the job that you want. You want to be a web dev, like back end, then you're going to have to have a GitHub portfolio that has back end projects. If you want to be a UI designer in fashion, then you should have portfolios that have interfaces for fashion apps. Um, so those that's kind of what you need to do like what is it that you want from this job hunt from this career change and your portfolio needs to reflect that um okay guys i think this is it um yes sinclair i do have to slap on my eyebrows um i tell that to all my students if they try to surprise me with a video call i'm like girl i don't have my eyebrows on um Yes, yes. CF actually did do a hackathon for students. Um, it was promoted in the Slack community. Um, let's see. It was like on the 17th, actually. Yes, I do have links to portfolios that I like. Um, uh, 
let me actually I'm gonna have to send you guys a lot of stuff Scott J. Wong. There's a number of them. Um, in fact, you guys, join me in the student community in the hashtags careers channel and I'll share portfolios. So I know that we're getting to the end of the time um, and we are recording this season. I'm doing it live and we're recording it now. Um, so we definitely will send it out to you guys. Um, I know that if I get started, like I'm just gonna be all day. Um, I used to be a librarian. So when people want <laughs> more information, like I can't stop myself. Um, if you're not a current student, Michelle, you can reach out, I think to Yakub. I think he's gonna give information for people who wanna be students. Um, but yeah, so thank you guys. Um, it was a pleasure as always. I know I get really excited during these things and I'm talking really quickly and I'm throwing everything at you. Um, but if you have questions, I'm in the student Slack community. You can always ping me there. Um, I do office hours and stuff like that. Um, Michelle, yeah, Coop will probably send the links in the recording email. But yeah, so um, just so you guys who are students who know, every Wednesday I do office hours where it's a lot like this, where people just ask me questions. So if you do have questions, join me in the office hours won't you um anyway guys thanks again yakub i don't know how to like turn off this webinar so i'm just gonna like keep on talking until no nope, he's ending it never mind i think he did the thing thanks he's the one who put the hook and he's dragging me off the stage now <laughs> but